Welcome to the first episode of the Jonathan Edwards podcast. My name is Chris Wozniki, and I have the privilege of being a research fellow at the Jonathan Edwards Center, or as I like to call it, the JEC. We've decided to tackle a topic that Edwards had a thing or two to say about, revival. Now, if you've been paying attention, any attention to social media and realistically, even traditional media, you know that some things have been going down at Asbury University, some things that people have labeled a quote unquote revival. Tom McCall, who teaches uh, at Asbury Seminary, has called it a surprising work of God. Listen to how he describes it in a recent article in Christianity Today. Most Wednesday mornings at Asbury University are like any other. A few minutes before 10, students begin to gather in Hughes Auditorium for chapel. Students are required to attend a certain number of chapels each semester, so they tend to show up as a matter of routine. But this past Wednesday was different. After the benediction, the gospel choir began to sing a final chorus, and then something began to happen that defies easy description. Students did not leave. They were struck by what seemed to be a quiet but powerful sense of transcendence. They did not want to go. They stayed and continued to worship. I teach theology across the street at Asbury Theological Seminary, and when I heard of what was happening, I immediately decided to go to the chapel to see for myself. When I arrived, I saw hundreds of students singing quietly. They were praising and praying earnestly for themselves and their neighbors and our world, expressing repentance and contrition for sin and interceding for healing, wholeness, peace, and justice. Some were reading and reciting scripture. Others were standing with arms raised. Several were clustered in small groups praying together. A few were kneeling on the altar rail in front of the auditorium. Some were laying prostrate, while others were talking to one another their faces bright with joy. Now, that really sounds like a beautiful thing. And I know that podcasts are often dominated by hot takes. Everyone wants to weigh in and share their opinion on whatever's the latest thing that's going on. But that's not why we're here today. As I've sat with the reality of Asbury and the reports of what's been going on in other schools like Samford, I thought a lot of people are raising some really interesting points about the nature of revival it might be a good time to take a look back at the most significant theologian of revival, Jonathan Edwards. So we've invited the director of the JEC here at Gateway, Dr. Ch Chris Chun. How's it going, Dr. Chun? I'm doing well, Dr. Wozniki. Can I call you Chris? You can absolutely call me Chris. <laughs> that definitely works. Uh, yeah, I'm de delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Great. Um, so, you know, students at Gateway and the larger world of Jonathan Edwards Scholarship will definitely know who you are, but not everyone in our audience will know the Dr. Chris Chun. So could you take a minute and just introduce yourself, maybe where you studied, what your role is at Jonathan Edwards Center, and what your area of research is, you know, all that fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, I, the director of Jonathan Edwards Center at Gateway, uh, sometimes we're known as the uh, Jonathan Edwards Center West uh, by the people that who are around us, the Global Edwards Center. Uh, we're also, I am also the professor of church history here at Gateway, as well as the uh, department chair of uh, history and theology department here. Um, I've enjoyed uh, looking at Edwards and one, I guess, special thing or makes us unique among many other Edwards Center around the globe is that we sort of specialize in Jonathan Edwards' legacy in uh, Baptist or should I say Baptist tradition, but we're certainly not limited to that. That sounds really exciting. Um, so bonus question, you weren't expecting this. Um, what's the best part about living in Southern California? You know, Gateway is located here in Southern California. What's what's the best part? Yeah, I would say one of the things that makes us set apart from perhaps some other areas is that we are living in a metropolitan area um, and where, you, where the world kind of converges, the diversity of students here, all the world are, are here. Uh, uh, Gateway Seminary is one of the most ethnically diverse, diverse seminary in the world. And because, of, because we're uh, located in Los Angeles Basin, we also enjoy uh, the, you know, 
driving distance, like maybe 40 minute driving distance from the beautiful Southern California be beaches <laughs> in the sand. And also, if you drive about another 45 minutes, you get to go to the mountains and even ski there in Big Bear. And so you get to really enjoy the, uh, the beauty of God's creation here in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, so, and then also this is the home of the revival in some ways. Azusa Street Revival uh, was uh, born here in this uh, region. Um, and so there are many great things about uh, Southern California. I love one of the cultural center and cultural icons of the United States. Yeah, and, and as we speak, uh, as the moment of this recording, there's a blizzard warning, so there'll be lots of snow in our mountains. Yeah, if you're an avid skier, this is a good place to be. Yeah. At this time. So, um, you know, Jonathan Edwards by, is considered by many to be the premier analyst of revival. He was forced to think about the nature of revival by the Great Awakening. That was uh, that spurred him on to think about those sorts of things. For those of us in our audience who might not know what the Great Awakening is, could you just give us a summary? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm sort of, I would say I'm a church historian, so I'd like to kind of dive back into history and give it's the broader context uh, as we come to early 1700 in America. We are now third or fourth generation of Puritan settlers who arrived in uh, New England shore, American shore. Uh, Puritan had a dream of establishing the city upon the hill for nations to seize, almost like an American utopian dream. But um, strangely enough, just three, four generations later, not too many a generation, kind of spiritual decline has set in. A deadness were affecting the American churches. It was a time of, you could say, a dead orthodoxy, or Edwards put it, dullness. And there was a dullness, boredom with the gospel, with many parts of the people and matters of sins began to spring up. So when Edwards arrived in Northampton, uh, Massachusetts in 1727 to assist his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, to pastor his church, he was disturbed by what was happening around him, particularly among the young people. <laughs> Edwards put it, all these young people were night walking and tavern hunting. Uh, Night walking and tavern hunting. What do you think that means, right? It's, um, so, but so by uh, 1729, he was helping, but, and then the revival broke out in Everett's church in Northampton, uh, 1734 and 1735. And with the uh, preaching of zealous, young, determined preacher of New Jersey and Massachusetts, the flame of the revival is being felt, uh, warming people's heart and bringing people to understanding of God's grace, but there really was no broader Great Awakening until George Whitfield came from England. So Whitfield is linked with a various revival, what we produce in America, history is called the First Great Awakening. And John Edward, of course, was preaching the same gospel along with Whitfield and and, and many people, many people were converted. A repentance occur, occurred by thousands uh, in American colonies. And the message was, you must be born again. That was the message. And people were converting and repenting by enormous amount of uh, movement that was taking place. That was the beginning, I, I would say, the Great Awakening. Now, you used the word revival uh, when you were describing uh, the nature of this historic event. What is a revival? How would you define that? Well, um, late uh, Dr. Richard Lovelace, who was my professor at Gordon-Conwell when I was a student there, he wrote a great deal about spirituality of Jonathan Edwards and revival. And he is the author of Dynamics of Spiritual Life. It's a book that I highly recommend, written by Dr. Lovelace. Um, and according to Dr. Lovelace, this is how he defines revival. Revival is infusion of 
spiritual life imparted by the Holy Spirit to existing parts of Christ's body. I'll say that I'll say it again, okay? Revival is an infusion of new spiritual life imparted by the Holy Spirit to existing parts of Christ's body. In church history, a revival occurs uh, in low point of spirituality in the life of the church, a lack of gospel ministry, low morality, often coupled with theological liberalism. Uh, not many people are being converted, so the church attendance was very low, weak, minimal number of Christians in the pews. And then there comes a revival with this infusion of new Christian life, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, followed by this massive conversion, mass conversion, basically takes care of the church attendance problem. So that will be a uh, revival. Yeah, it sounds like the sort of thing that every Christian should wish would happen. Um, <laughs> but obviously, um, there would be cases where it seems like there's some event or a series of, um, yeah, just some event where you see this increased passion, where it looks like the Holy Spirit is working. Um, so there might be times where that is authentic, and there might be times where that uh, might actually be uh, unauthentic. Um, Edwards was concerned to test the authenticity of revivals, or at least to come up with marks of testing the authenticity of revivals. Why was he concerned about that? What was sort of the, the cultural context of why some people were saying, hey, this, this revival that's happening at Northampton isn't the real deal, or it is the real deal. Why, why were people concerned about the authenticity of these events? That's a great question. So Edwards uh, um, came to Northampton and he saw the revival. In fact, he called it a surprising work of God, right? He just came out of nowhere. Just like uh, McCall called it <laughs> in his yeah, Christianity I, Today article. That's right. Yeah, I think McCall is probably uh, piggybacking or referring to Edwards' uh, treatise and surprising work of God, right? So it's not something that to be expected. They expect it, but just he said, just God gave it to him. He came to his town in 1734. Uh, many young people uh, came to young, many young people first, uh, and then when Edwards went to Northampton, um, he was really um, first dismayed at the lack of interest of the, among young people in the congregation for the things of God. But things suddenly changed, um, and there was new interest. Uh, new love for God, new zeal for God, for especially among the youth and young people. I, you know, this is sort of the what's going on in Asbury. Uh, it, seems like it began with the young people, um, Gen Z, if you will. So, in that sense, I see some you know interesting parallel. Um, and then from revival spread to the adults in Ed Edward's time, and Edwards could write. Uh, he said, uh, "Quote a great." an earnest concern about great things of religion and the eternal world became universal in all parts of town. So Edward wanted to people to carry on as in their work, but he was also delighted to see this love and zeal uh, that had came to Northampton. Okay, but um, as Edward describes the conviction, outward things that people were convicted of, but there were also many of them are convicted of pride and envies, and people were trying to deal with all these sins and make them right with one another, and greater awakening took place. But then, why test authenticity? Well, as um, great awakening ripped throughout New England, uh, it got complicated by lay preachers and critics of learned clergies. These people, many of the late people were critical of these pastors. And some of these critics were overzealous, it even, even manifest bizarre behavior. And they say they're converted. And, and many of the, these extraordinary manifestations became a point of contention. 
between the old light, uh, the people that who were against the revival, and the new lights, uh, people that were for the revival. So Edwards was set out to discern the genuine work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so Edward worked several works intended to interpret the Spirit of God in New England, what was happening. He wrote a faithful narrative and surprising work of God in 1737. And there's a distinguishing mark of the work of the Spirit of God in 1741. Some thoughts concerning the present revival and religion in New England in 1741. Uh, all of that can be found, actually, in uh, Volume 4 of, of the work of Jonathan Edwards. Um, the, the, this volume is called The Great Awakening, Volume 4. And then, of course, you have the all-famous uh, religious affection Jonathan Edwards wrote in 1746. He's out there to figure out and discern the genuine work of the Holy Spirit because this became a point of contention and division among people in the congregation and people around him. Which volume four and religious affections are both available in paperback. So they're yeah. relatively affordable compared to the, yeah. the other works of Edwards. And also I should mention that all of the works of Edwards uh, can be found for free um, on the E.L. Jonathan Edwards website. That's right. So if you want to read this to. for yourself, you don't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So you don't have to now mortgage your house in order to read Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> right. Um, so in these, some of these texts that you mentioned, he identifies some marks that are not helpful for determining <laughs> whether a revival is authentic or not. Um, mm -hmm. They don't, they basically don't sway it either way. You can't say, That's oh, cool. this is happening, therefore it's inauthentic, or it's happening, mm -hmm. therefore it's authentic. What mm -hmm. are some of those... I don't want to call them unhelpful marks, but what are some of that kind of mark that Jonathan Edwards talks about? Yeah, so thanks for bringing uh, religious affections. In, 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 this is a volume two. You can find it in the Yale edition. And um, Jonathan Edwards in religious affections, there are three parts. And the part two of religious affection deal with that question. He discussed 12 signs that are not signs, whether a person's religious affection are godly. When uh, he talks about the word religion, that he means in that context means Christian affection or religious affection, because that's the word that they use. Seems like the word religion has a very different connotation in our, our days than how Edwards used. So that is a truly regenerate person. Regenerate means true, truly saved person may exhibit these signs or he may not. And truly unregenerate person, the person who's not saved, may also exhibit these signs, or he may not. So if it's the case that there, if the sign can be exhibited in both believer and non-believer, if they can be exhibited these signs, Edward say, well, they really cannot be signs of mark of the true religious affections. So he lists 12 of them. 12. <laughs> Obviously, uh, I don't have time to talk about all 12 of them. Uh, would you like me to talk about at least one of them? That would be great. Okay. So I wanted to sort of uh, cherry pick. Um, obviously, we have a limited time, so I can't talk about all 12 of them, but I'll just, just mention one of 12, okay? So this is a third sign. Edward described third sign as this. It's no sign that affections are truly gracious and affections or that are not, that they cause those who have them to be fluent, fervent, and abundant in, in taking the great things of religions, okay? So what is he saying here? He's talking about in revival setting, he's talking about fervency or Fluency or talking, people talking about religion and verbosity. We could call it verbosity, you know, just close to the word, right? He's, he's talking about people talking about religion. In Edward's day, um, there are people who saw this fluency or ver verbosity and religious thing. If you have that, that's a sure sign of religion. Uh, anyone who could speak freely about religious matter. 
But Jonathan Edwards said, hold on a second here. And he, he writes this, quote, Through scriptures, be full of rules and how we should judge of our own state and also how we should be conducted in our opinion of others. Yet, we have nowhere any rules by which to judge ourselves or others to be in a good state. From any such effect, for this is but the religion of the mouth and of the tongue. And what is in the scripture represented by the leaves of a tree, which, though tree ought not be without them, yet are nowhere given an evidence of goodness of the tree. So Edward is saying here that this talk of verbosity and people talking about religion is not a sign either way. And we see this in scripture, both commands us to speak to others about things of God, and yet also warns about those who lips may praise God, and yet whose de deeds show hatred for God. So just because people could talk the talk, Edward say, do not necessitate that this is a true mark of the distinguishing mark of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what, what you think about it, but that is what Edwards think. Yeah, and uh, the best place, if you mentioned uh, there are too many to, to cover today, if somebody wants to go read this in a very concise mm -hmm. manner, you know, they don't want to pick up the entire uh, book, um, where would they go? Is there a particular text that Edwards has that's really short that people can access? Yeah, the religious affect affection is definitely his masterpiece, but uh, one of his masterpiece uh, and, and Magna Carta of, of uh, understanding and interpreting Christian experience. But in if you need one of something short uh, to, to, I would recommend Distinguishing Mark of the Work of the Spirit of God, um, where he lays out some of the key marks of the authentic revival uh, and so, sort of give you uh, almost a test, like look for these marks. Mm -hmm. And he he lists at least several of these. Yeah, this, so uh, distinguishing marks. That's uh, what you want to go ahead and look up. Um, so you mentioned a mark that was not very helpful for determining authenticity. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the marks that do distinguish a authentic revival that Edwards would say? Yeah, so let's kind of dive in to distinguish mark of the Holy Spirit um, because Edwards does talk about it. I'm not. Sh I have uh, some excerpts that I could read, but um, yeah, unless you want me to read them, um, let me just kind of uh, give some category. And if you want me to read some of Edwards' excerpt because they are a bit lengthy, um, I could do that, or I don't have to. Yeah, just uh, go ahead and give us a broad. Uh picture of those marks and then maybe we'll home in on one or two that are especially interesting. Sure, okay. So I like to highlight four of them. Uh, the first is a Christological test uh, based on John chapter 16, 14. The second will be the moral test, John 14, 21. Um, and where and then after that you have the doctrinal test. Um, Edwards based that on Galatians chapter 1, 8. And then you had a relational test, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse uh, 37 and 40. And he talks about these four criteria and how you is as a distinguishing mark of the Holy Spirit. Um, regarding the Christological test, he wants us to ask, is Jesus Christ more central? As a result of this experience, is Christ more central in my life? Or is it Christ or the revival leader who became more valuable in my life? More than before, I'm, I'm just tossing off some names, you know, you know, Joseph Smith or Mary Becker Eddy, you, know, you fill in the blank, you know. Is it the revival leader more valuable in my life or is it Christ 
became more valuable, more central, more love in my life. And that will be the Christological test that Edwards wants us to talk about. The second one that I'd like to highlight is the moral test. Um, is my life more holy as a result of this experience? Does this experience make my life holier than before? Does this experience produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life? Does this experience help me to get rid of sin that I've been struggling, greed or lust or pride or whatever? Does it help me to get rid of the sins that I've been struggling? The real work of the Holy Spirit, Edward says, will produce holy life and holy living. The third category will be the doctrinal test which is, does this experience lined up with God's word? So if the Holy Spirit is speaking, it's not the angels from the pit, but the Holy Spirit, the teaching will be in conformity with the teachings of Christ and his apostles, Edward Stink. And then you have the relational test. Does it increase my love for others? You will know them by their fruits. You will know them by their fruits. Does this love, does this increase my love for others? Um, so, you know, how, how do you treat your neighbor? Do you love them more than before? So this is some of the thing that uh, Edwards highlight in his distinguished mark of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so one thing he says about these marks is that he says they plainly show the finger of God and are sufficient to outweigh a thousand such little objections as many make from oddities, irregularities, and errors in conduct, and the mm -hmm. delusions and scandals of some professors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so these are really crucial. You know, there might be little things here and there that seem odd, or maybe they're not doing this exactly the way that we would do it. Mm -hmm. um, and these are really crucial. So one that um, I've seen people mention quite a bit is uh, when there are, when some people have objected to what's going on in mm -hmm. Asbury, they always they tend to ask the question, "Well, how is this going to make a change in the world?" Like it's great that people are singing and worshiping and having this private experience, um, but what's the the moral upshot? of this. And that's the thing that Edwards is concerned about, you know, uh, you mentioned two of those as distinguishing marks. So could you talk a little bit about uh, what he has to say specifically about the moral um, test or the moral mark? Moral mark. Okay. So he, he based it in first, uh, he based it on John 14, 21. Um, and he, this is what he writes. Uh, Love, not the world, neither things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of eyes, the pride of life is not the Father, and but is of the world. And by, quote, the world, Apostle evidently means everything that pertain to the interest of sin have comprehended all corruptions, lust of men, and all those act and object by which they are gratified. So one of the, the moral tests is that does this experience actually, is it just the emotional experience that you go through or does it actually produce the fruit of spirit in their life? And, and help you to be free from the bondage of the sin that you've been struggling. And that will be one of the tests uh, why, if this is indeed genuine work of the Holy Spirit. So when you look at things like um, Asbury's Revival, it's, it's going on right now, it's this current event. And the good, uh, good question will be asked, okay, what would uh, this movement um, will produce six months later in the people that who have been involved in it. What would it produce a year later, uh, two years later? And I think those kind of questions will be a uh, good thing for us to consider because if the if according to Edwards, um, if this life, if this experience 
became in a such way that my life is holy and bears the fruit of spirit, then according to Edwards, this is a, one of the mark of the genuine work of the Holy Spirit. So did Edwards see these marks uh, in the revival that he experienced? He did have a certain degree. I don't think uh, for Edwards, uh, <clears throat> um, it, it's not something that you, you know, turn on like a switch, you know. There's a degree of um, the fruits that he sees and, and some more than others, some more evident than other in different seasons. But he did see a, a, some of it and you see a, a lasting a fruit as well. Uh, one of the uh, great legacy of the Great Awakenings that you see this number of different um, what was um, Great Awakening school, like for example, uh, Brown University, uh, Dartmouth, and other schools were founded because of the Great Awakening and the revi uh, revivals uh, that was happening among the students. And then one uh, school that was more for the revival and, and so on and so forth. So you see these kind of lasting impact on uh, people around him. People like even David Brainer, who have been uh, very influential and impacted by the Great Awakening and bore much fruit for Edward's ministry and and long after he passed as well. So there definitely is a, a legacy in terms of the service to the church and, and this revival yeah. that Edwards was a part of, um, along with Whitfield and, and Wesley and, and right. others. Um, as we think about Edwards's influence, mm -hmm. uh, not just in his immediate context, but how does Edwards work influence the way that people have thought about revival down the line right. this is so, more of a, a, mm -hmm. a scholarly kind of question as opposed mm -hmm. to just a pure here's the history um right. what influence does he have on people who think about revival today yes i mean like immediately um this may be a bit of a controversial uh comment but um uh, there's there's uh, in the history of uh, revival uh, and study of revival, sometimes historians make a this sharp uh, connection between the first and the second Great Awakening. Uh, but um, I'm not sure, yeah, although I think those are helpful paradigm, I'm not so sure those kind of uh, paradigms are as sharp as a demarcation as people tend to uh, generally believe. Like, for example, one of the theological or architect for the Second Great Awakening was Charles Finney. He was another revivalist theologian of the Second Great Awakening. And sometimes um, uh, there's a sh sharp um, distinction between the work, the min ministry work that Edwards did on First Great Awakening and what Finney did on Second Great Awakening. Um, but um, according to Finney, and whether people who agree with Finney or not, he thought himself as Edwardsian, and he was carrying out Edward's legacy as he believed that he was. So um, even though many people see Finney's ministry as something that was completely different from Edward's uh, revival, um, in Finney's mind, that was not what he was trying to do, and he actually claims Edward's mental. It's really interesting because most people would not put them uh, together uh, for various reasons. Um, so just to, to bring this uh, to a close, mm -hmm. what do you think that we, living in the 21st century, mm -hmm. um, in this global world, and me and you living in this global city, uh, of Los Angeles, but audiences all over. Um, what should we take away from Edwards on this topic of revival? Yeah, I think that Edwards, what he does, and, and he does it so well, is there is a need for a dis discernment, okay? Uh, there's a need for, especially people living in the 21st century. Uh, we are now living in... Uh, Global Christianity, uh, I think uh, Philip Jenkins uh, in, in, in the last decade uh, or two decades ago have um, 
brought very forcefully that Christianity has, is no longer Western religion, um, has shifted, the gravity has shifted from Western to non-Western religion, if you will. And so where is Christianity growing today? Well, it's in Latin America, it's in Africa, it's even in China. But many of these um, uh, non-Western world, majority world, uh, the Christianity, you see a lot of the charismatic or should I say revivalistic activities that are breaking out. So these are the real issues that our missionaries are facing. So this Edward's call to discernment is a very helpful one because whatever the experience that people may face, whether that be Latin America, Africa, or China, or wherever, that our experience should be grounded in scripture and lead us back into scripture. That's what Edwards argues. So when you look at, is there something to take away in the 24th century? When you look at revival like Asbury revival, as with all revival, not just Asbury, yes, there could be a dangerous elements and revival. Sometimes we have seen in history, revival could go drastically wrong as their outpouring of the Holy Spirit Simultaneously, there could be a counterfeit revival that often uh, the, uh, the, the principality um, put force. And so sometimes you really need to discern. So there are dangerous revival, but just because there are dangerous aspect to the revival does not make this revival wrong. I think it's fallacious to infer that just because there are dangerous element, it does not make revival automatically wrong. So I think therefore it's important for both opponent and proponent of the revival uh, to see this need for careful discernment that Edward is calling for. It's probably in that people who have tendency to be open and uncritical ought to use their God-given mind to think more objectively, theologically, and biblically when dealing with revival. Or the experience. On the other end, those who have been critical attitude towards revival um, ought to be careful so that that they may not quench the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's going on in, in John Edwards' uh, religious affection. He's talking to people that who are uncritically just following his uh, fanaticism. And then that's some of the new life opponent who are very critical of the clergy and so on. And then he turns around and fires at the other side too, saying that you all like, you know, those people who are critical, be careful that you may not be quenching the work of the Holy Spirit. So I think that is definitely something that um, Edwards could help us, that our experiences should be grounded in the scripture and lead us back into scripture. Yeah, th maybe this reveals a little bit more about my own personal character. And one of the reasons I particularly enjoy Edwards on Revival is because there is an emphasis on discernment, but also an emphasis on charity. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a, there's a, I, I discern a lot of charity in, in what he says. And just to use that quote that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. you know, there might be a thousand little objections, oddities, irregularities, errors in conduct. But if we focus on the essential pieces, is there greater esteem for Jesus? Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, are people working against their personal sin? Is there mm -hmm. an increased love for God's word? Mm -hmm. um, is there an increased desire for truth? Do people love God and others more as a result of that? Then mm -hmm. there can be a little bit of leeway because people mm -hmm. are not going to get things perfectly. But those are the things that really matter. Um, so right. I've been encouraged in reading that. Um, mm -hmm. and I think all of us would do well mm -hmm. to take that posture of charity, right. but also discernment. I think we're called mm -hmm. to both. Uh, mm -hmm. And scripture calls us to both. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I would even say that we actually do need each other. People that are who tend to be uncritically accepting of everything, and those people who tend to be overly critical, I do think that they 
do need each other. They bring different things to the table. People that who tend to be um, more experientially, practically minded, um, such engagement of emotional faculty uh, manifests very positively in heartfelt worship and experience to God. And to tell the truth, I think that those are the very things that um, people that who are critical of the revival could learn from if they're humble enough to listen to the other side. And yet, at the same time, you have the people that who are critical uh, of the revival, and they have a tendency to have a, a strong historical understanding of Christian doctrine, you know, and and they have a, their strength is having this theological depth of experience in the Christian faith. And they, they could have a theological precision in handling the biblical texts. That I think the people who are for the revival, proponent of the revival, should learn from if they too are humble enough to listen. So talking about the charity, if the both sides could hear each other and not talk past one another and, and, uh, and, and, and do it that way, I think it could really help the, the unity of the church that uh, Paul talks a great deal about in Ephesians, the unity of the universal church of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's so great. Well, thank you, Dr. Chun. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with me today to think a little bit about Edwards and the nature of revival uh, and even some of the things that are going on in current events today. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm, del I'm delighted to be a, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me, enjoying my conversation with you. And uh, it's been a very good and enlightening experience. I hope that we could continue our conversation. And we definitely will. We'll continue these conversations about Jonathan Edwards on further episodes of the Jonathan Edwards podcast. Again, I am Chris Wozniki, uh, the research fellow here at the JEC. And thank you for listening.